I am Campbell Miller, husband, father of two, and feature film director with EWTN. Faith and Life tells the stories of Catholics living their life through their faith. These inspiring people tell us where they have come from and where God is taking them. In this episode of Faith and Life, I will be chatting to Father Richard Gibbons, the rector of Knock Shrine. Knock is Ireland's national shrine, with over one million visitors per year, and it all started when Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John, and the Lamb of God appeared to the Irish people on a rainy August evening in 1879. This was a time when Ireland was going through its second major famine, a time when the Irish people needed a message of hope. Knock holds a very special place in the hearts of the Irish people. What is it like to come to work here every day? It's a, it's a great opportunity to help encourage people in their faith. Um, like any job, it, it has its good times and its not so good times, but uh, on the whole, it's, it's an opportunity where people come to pray and to be at peace and to they, they feel a special sacredness in the place. So um, it's my job and the job of my colleagues to help them and encourage them in the faith. And we find that humbling and we find it encouraging and we find it challenging. But uh, in all of that, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for, for proclaiming the faith. And for the viewers, tell us, where did it all start? What happened in Knock in 1879? Well, on Thursday evening, on a Thursday evening, 21st of August, 1879, at approximately 8 p.m., a light was seen by a number of local parishioners, uh, ordinary people passing by, and they saw a light at the gable end of the parish church. Remember now, there was nothing here except a parish church and a few um, um, thatched cottages around. Mm -hmm. And uh, they saw this light, they went, they investigated, they told some people, and they went to investigate. And upon investigating, as you can see in the mosaic right behind me here, that they came across the um, figures standing there. Um, and the figures turned out to be, from their perspective, Our Lady, St. John, the Evangelist, St. Joseph, a cross, an altar, and the Lamb of God, and around which they described as hovering beings, uh, um, angels in, 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 in other words. And uh, it wasn't just for a select number, one or two people, or just a select group of people. Um, the entire village turned out to see this. So it was an extraordinary experience and an extraordinary, extraordinary occurrence in that time. And would you have many visitors come here to knock? We have roughly, in the region of about a million people or so every year, a little over. It d depends on what's going on. Uh, for last year, for example, we celebrated our 140th anniversary of the apparition, so a huge number of, we're still trying to calculate, uh, of people came for that. And other years then it might be a little bit quieter for the papal visit, of course, grew up again. So it, it, it ebbs and flows quite a bit. So you're the rector of Knox Shrine, but you're also the parish priest. That's so right. that must be a very different job. Yeah, the, it's it's two hats really um, in the same in the same job, um, because the apparition occurred at the parish church. There's an inextricable link between the shrine as it evolved and the parish itself. So um, you're both the parish priest and also the rector of the National Marian Shrine. Father Richard has a level of energy and enthusiasm that's simply infectious and it's safe to say he has a can-do attitude. He's dynamic. Uh, I think when he knows what he wants, he, he, he's able to go after it and work hard to get it. Uh, I think he achieves great things for Knock Shrine. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town called Lewisburg um, on the west coast in County Mayo, uh, right on the coast in fact of Clue Bay. Um, beautiful little town and uh, I was raised just a, a mile from the town in a little place called Four Miles. So, um, what was it like growing up there? We grew up in a farm so it was very natural. You worked and 
uh, you had to do the jobs and all the rest of it, even if you didn't want to do them, you still mm -hmm. had to do them. Yeah. And um, everybody else was kind of in the same boat as you. The scenic area was beautiful, like you had Clue Bay, you had the mm -hmm. islands, you had um, the mountains, Crowpatrick, all of that. You know, you kind of took that for granted. Because yes. that's where you yes. grew up, and there you and it was always that, there. That was it always there, yeah. And I take it you would have had to have quite a good work ethic growing up on a farm, yeah. taking that from your father. Oh, you, you you had to do your jobs, yeah. That was it. <laughs> there was no there was no real discussion about that. You know, you knew they had to be done anyway yes. because it was very intensive manual work, you know. And that's um, came in handy, I'm sure, working here in Knock, being the well, rector and parish yeah, priest. Yeah, well, where it came in handy was that you knew that you didn't want to do that for the rest of your life. So you had to, so as my, <laughs> my father said, you're either good on the land or you're, you're good at your books. So I definitely wanted to, to be good at the books as best you can anyway. Yes. Because um, uh, I did not want to go, go, I did not want to work on the land. And in fact, none, none of us did really. And, and so uh, the farm isn't farmed by any of us anymore. We still have it, but it's not farmed. Uh, so, but we kind of wanted to do our own thing anyway, and that's and that was encouraged. Mm -hmm. Education was massively encouraged in our house. And did your father have an inkling that you were going to go on to the priesthood? No, not at all. No, no, they they got no inkling of that whatsoever, until maybe I was about twenty one, twenty two, twenty about twenty two, twenty three. And that was a bit of a yeah. shock to them then? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. I remember it was actually working on the farm. I was at home helping Dad with something or other. And I told him, and uh, he said, oh, <laughs> right, he said, <laughs> I was just finishing off my degree. He said, finish your degree first, and then you can do whatever you want. But finish your degree first, just in case you have something. And I, I, I happen to agree with that. So, yes, yes, yeah, because yeah. I wasn't going to bail out just, just because I was thinking of that, because uh, it, that wouldn't be practical because I'm practical you, you you kind of look if if priesthood didn't our seminary seminary didn't work for you mm -hmm. I was willing to give it a year and if it didn't work I needed something to come back to so it made absolute sense finish what you're doing first the road that you wanted to go on and then try this one so you grew up in a faithful family then we did indeed absolutely and uh, it, like it, it was pretty normal like it, it wasn't any more or any less faithful than any other family really um, my mother was quite religious my father not so much but uh, faithful in terms of going to mass and and encouraging us to go on the Sundays and all of that and mm -hmm. uh, we were very young I remember rosary in the house as well uh, in, in the evenings you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but you were always trying to kind of get out of that in some way, shape, or form. But, <laughs> yeah, but it was part of it was part of a normal, normal uh, family family upbringing. My path of life was going towards becoming a solicitor, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I wanted to do. And later on, then please God, marry and have kids and all that kind of thing. The, the normal route, yes. and that's what I intended to do, and that's what they thought I had planned. And then when. I decided to go in because I really didn't t tell anybody until it was kind of down to the wire because I wasn't sure mm -hmm. myself. And what happened? What, what made you... Well, it wasn't mind? anything blinding in terms of a, a massive revelation or anything. It was just a, a, an incremental kind of uh, a building up of what did you want to do with your life and where can you do the most good. And, uh, you know, I, I my faith was kind of off and on really until I went to university. And then at one point in university, I was challenged on the on the street. I remember just outside the university gates. This guy was encouraging me to go to some other. I can't remember the church, but it, it wasn't Catholic anyway. Yeah. And uh, he said, "Don't bother with with the cathedral." And when he said that, that kind of, I I kind of got a bit of a. Well, I said, "Why? Why would he say that now?" Mm -hmm. And that kind of made me think. And in a way, I, I'm thankful that he did say that because it got me back into thinking about my faith and about why I'm a Catholic and why should I believe in this anyway and what's, what's, what is the point. And when you made that decision, uh, I want to go on to become a priest, mm. did you ever question, is this the right route, is this where God wants me to oh, go? Oh, absolutely. And I even did that in seminary. That was going right, that was a constant theme. <laughs> and that didn't <laughs> leave you at all. Uh, right up to the diaconate when uh -huh. I was or, or, uh, ordained a deacon. Um, that was constantly, I remember doing a retreat just before I was ordained a deacon in a, in a monastery outside of Rome, Bassano Romano, I'll never forget it, a huge monastery. I remember at one point, the, one part of the monastery, there were a group of young people around my own age, I was 24 at the time, mm -hmm. and they were all enjoying themselves, they were there and there were young lay 
people that were there uh, on a um, spiritual weekend, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they'd like the music and everything, and that was kind of a and I, I was it was a juxtaposition. Right. I was there on my own, kind of doing my retreat and trying to focus on on the importance of ordination to the priesthood. Then at that time, I was a deacon at that stage. And then I was looking at this, and that was kind of, well, would I rather be here or there? One morning I got up and uh, I went to the chapel. And uh, I remember St. Ignatius doing this when he was kind of trying to discern something or trying to come to a conclusion about some aspect. Mm -hmm. He opened the scripture. Now, it's not for, he just opened it randomly and just see what, what would come out at you. Yes. So I said, okay. I said it was almost a last resort kind of a thing, and uh, I said, "All right, let's let's see where this this may may go." Uh -huh. Opened it up, and what I saw now, you could have hit me with I don't know what, but floored me anyway. Right. The line was, um, "He who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God." Now I'm not saying to people. <laughs> That's what you do when you have a problem and you get the answer straight away. Right. I was just, this was just kind of going simply on faith. And um, this was your message. That was the message. Mm -hmm. And I kind of stuck with me. I said, all right, okay, I put my hand to the plough. I, you know, it, it feels right to me. I know there's this life and there's a whole host of different lives. And the, you, like, you know, you come with the phrase, far away hills are green and all this kind of thing. But like, mm -hmm. I, I invested five years in deciding to become a priest to see where it would take me. Growing up, did you come to Knock? Every year we, we would come as part of the family. There were, there were eight in total in the family. My parents and six, three and three, three boys, three girls. Um, so it was part of a normal year that you would come to Knock at some point. And uh, Knock was part and parcel of, of, of our life of faith as well. You've brought some photographs here and mm. one of these I noticed is, is of your ordination. That's right. Yeah, and in in this one, I see this this is this is your family here. That's my family there. That's right. My parents there. My mum, uh, dad John, and uh, mum Mary, and my three sisters and two brothers. Also, you've got a photograph here now, and this is mm. uh, Saint Pope John Paul. That's and right. Is that your mother and that's, father? That's with my you? mother there, my dad there, and my classmates were just uh, ordained to the uh, diaconate. And we were in the Irish College at the time. That's where we mm -hmm. studied, in the Irish College in the Gregorian University. And, and there are families there at the background, uh, all the guys' families. And uh, so the rector of the time, Monsignor John, uh, Bishop John Fleming, as he is today in Killala, organised for us to go over and to be part of the public audience on the Wednesday. So mm -hmm. we're, we're delighted we were able to meet, meet um, um, St. John Paul II. It stands, it stands out. We serve as from actually from, uh, during our period of time there in Rome as well. Lovely. Yeah. And that must have been a very special moment. Oh yeah, moment. massive for, for mum and dad, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, also there, there was this photograph, I see, this was at the same time, is that right? No, no, that's way back, that's when I was <laughs> far, far younger. <laughs> uh, that's when I started off as a seminarian. Okay. And um, that's Father Reginald Foster. He was the papal Latinist, and um, he taught Latin in, in the Gregorian. So you had to do a year of Latin. Mm -hmm. um, but he was willing to... He, he was a character. Uh, very famous in, in, the, in the community. Okay. Very famous. Um, short temper, uh -huh. but a great teacher. Wonderful teacher. And uh, so he was so good that a lot of us took a second year with him because he was he was just excellent the way that that uh, that he would he had his own methodology and um, and it was and a huge insight in terms of the history of the church and everything and then b before all of this was, was taking place um, you had joined the FCA is that right oh yes well that's uh, I, I, I I don't know how you got that information but uh, yes th well, that was only that was a uh, that was uh, we'll, we'll do a bit of research bit of and research. we have our contacts do. yes yes the FCA is the uh, reserve army in, in Ireland. It's um, everybody went in. <laughs> it's not. It's not that we were highly tactical individuals. Oh, okay. How we would be deployed <laughs> anywhere of strategic value, but um, <laughs> everybody went in. It's kind of um, not to be disparaging, but it, 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 you, you just went in because everybody else went in. You, 
went on camp every 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 year, uh, which was to a military camp, and so mm-hmm. you learn how to march and all that kind of stuff. So, but you became soldier of the year. Well, that was that's more information now that I don't know where you got, but yes, indeed, yeah, that well, that happened just at the. I don't even know how that <laughs> happened. I don't know. I was a go- relatively good shot, and uh, so you don't know what the, what what was special about you that year. Uh, that um, I think I answered a few questions correctly, something like that. <laughs> 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 or, or else they were very, very. They were in need of giving, just giving it to somebody. Uh-huh. <laughs> Say, you'll do. <laughs> you can, you can, have, you can have that. But we never took it hugely seriously. And there must have been a sense of, I mean, discipline. In yes. Like that yeah. As well. Yeah. You you learned how to march, keep in time, all that, uh, salute, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, shoot ancient guns that were around probably at the time of the Boer War or something, yeah, yeah. and uh, things like that. You know, and. Uh, um, but uh, on, for the summer camp, uh, regular soldiers would be there to put you through your paces. And they were tough boys now. Is that right? Tough, tough, tough gentlemen. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's got a great sense of humour. Very funny. Um, he's a great man for impressions. You wouldn't think it, but he's great at impress- impersonations of people. Um, great wit. Uh, appreciates a joke and is well able to tell them himself too. I was also told that you used to play the fiddle. Yes, once upon a time. That's right. Yeah. So does that happen today? Well, to my shame, no. No. To my shame, no. I should have kept it on. I haven't played the violin for God knows how long. Years and years and years. Right. Um, but I used to, in school, again, no more than the local defence force and all of that, at secondary school level. Mm-hmm. We were in a band in secondary school, played the accordion for that, for the band and all of that. Like, an awful lot of people were involved in that. And then my dad was a musician, you see. Mm-hmm. And he was a singer, and so he he um, I learned by ear from him, and then I did more formal learning then in secondary school, took lessons and and exams and that kind of thing. And my mum sang as well, and it, it's on it's on both sides of the family, in fact. And here's a lovely photograph you, you've brought uh, with your mother and father. Yes, yeah, that was taken uh, just when I left my last the. My first parish I was in, Hedford, before I came to Knock, mm-hmm. uh, in, nine, in 2003. So I was three years, uh, four years ordained then. And did it mean a lot for your mother and father for you to be moved to here? I, I think so, yeah. Well, they kind of, they were happy as long as I was happy. And I, I'm sure they were very proud when you became the rector. Yeah, that was a different kettle of fish then, then as well, yeah. Um, um, but unfortunately, it, it, it was kind of tinged with the sadness because Monsignor... Quinn had died of a heart attack, and um, um, and you know he, he was only sixty five, and that was that just affected everybody, you know. He still even talked about today. Yes. And he's still very much in 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 memory and conversation and everything. Just the last day, I was at a wake, and his name came up about some aspect or another, and then a full conversation uh, went along that line. It just shows the love that the people had for him, you know. What were your first thoughts when you were sent here to knock? Oh, I can tell you exactly what my first thought was. I didn't want it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to come to knock. <laughs> I didn't want to go near knock. Oh, what, what were you because thinking? It, what was th- I was in a wonderful parish, Hedford, just outside Galway. I was only there three years. I was teaching in a secondary school, teaching history and religion and um, working the parish as a curate. And I loved it. And uh, there were things happening in the parish as well, and, and uh, the people were great. And I really, I, I expected to be there for maybe five or six years before you're transferred again. So I was only year three, so I never expected anything. And then the Archbishop called me in, and he said, you're going to be transferred from Hedford to Knock. And I said, Knock? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, really, it's a very, t- it's a tough place to come. Yeah. It, it, there's, it's hugely work orientated in terms of the parish and the, I knew that the parish and the shrine, and I really, I didn't know whether I would be up to that because the shrine has its own dynamic as itself, you know. Saying that, I'm sure in seminary you're not trained to be able to run a hotel and a caravan park mm. and a location in which you have a million visitors a year. Mm. So. Mm. 
Where do you get all the help for that? Yeah, I suppose the key, you're perfectly right. In seminary, you're training to be a priest. And really, that was one of the elements in, in terms of when I was assigned to knock that I wasn't too sure about um, in an ordinary parish you deal with what you're trained to do. Um, but here, you, you kind of have to marry, um, surround yourself by the best advice you can get. So you know that you're, you're, you're not in, in business and you're not running any, any business type place, even though there is a business element to it. So what you do is you find the best advice, the best people in that particular area that mm -hmm. can advise you and help you to make those decisions. And that's exactly what we did. And is it difficult mixing business and faith? It is initially, because you're always you must never lose the faith perspective in terms of what the business is. So you're not in it for profit. You're hoping that things will, will make money in order to sustain themselves and keep them going and maybe make a little bit extra in order to fund other projects. So you, it's, it's, you're, you should never fall into the trap of, I have to make a profit here. That's not what it's about. It's from the faith dimension all the time. That can be difficult because you, you want things to succeed and you want things to run well. But um, we, the committees that we formed up and the people that you surround yourself with will keep you kind of on the straight and narrow in terms of that. And you need to be able to, people need to be able to tell you the truth, even if you don't want to sort of hear it or tell you that something's not going very well and it might be your pet project and you might not want to hear it, but you know it's the best, that's the best advice, so that's it, okay? So you go with that, mm -hmm. because you know it's coming from a, a proper, um, place and, yes. and, and a faith-based place, if you know what I mean. So what would be the most stressful moments of your role as Rector of Knox Shrine? Um, some stressful moments can be, can vary. For example, it can be in terms of a big occasion that might be coming up. Let's say the papal visit, for instance, you want everything to go right, so there's a lot of work, a lot of organisation, a lot of people to put in various different places, making sure that things carry on and work out and all of that, there's mm -hmm. that stress. Then there's probably the stress of um, making sure that, um, that you're able to meet people's, pay people's wages and make sure that everything runs as, as it should run. There's a fair bit, fair bit of stress in that and a few uh, sleepless nights, especially if you take on a project look, like we did with the Basilica here in terms of its uh, renovation. Um, we had to shut it down for six months and um, uh, find the money to pay for that as well as keeping everything else going. So, and then, you know, um, other administrative stuff uh, that, that might be coming on your, on your mm -hmm. desk and your table and HR and all of that kind of thing. And so it, it kind of varies for varying degrees, you know. And you mentioned two moments there as stressful moments, which mm. are the papal visit mm. and also the renovation here of mm -hmm. the Basilica. Mm. But they must be two proud moments as well. Completely right, yeah. And, and it's, no, it's no different to any other job in terms of that, that regard. That if you're doing something well, you know, you, like if you're doing up, let's say you're doing your kitchen at home, you're going to be stressful about your doing yes, your kitchen, yes, getting the money, putting it in place, is it going to be done on time? And then when it's done, great job. You know, it's done as you'd like it to have been done. Um, so it's, it's no different than that, really. But um, we are proud of what has happened in terms of a visit of Pope Francis. And that went off extremely well, even if the weather didn't go as well as we thought. But the visit was fantastic. And the refurbishment of this great prayer space of the Basilica itself. That papal <coughs> visit wasn't your only time in recent years mm -hmm. that you have met Pope Francis uh, as a representative of Knock. Mm -hmm. You were also in St Peter's Basilica in Rome. We've, we've had actually over the last three years three moments with him. We, we've had the papal visit in 2018. Then last year we celebrated the 140th anniversary of the apparition since 1879 and we had our, um, commissioned our new statue, pilgrim statue, which is the one that you see there. And we had that made in northern Italy and transported down to Rome for him to bless it before the novena last, in, in August of last year. And thirdly, we were invited to participate in the um, special Sunday for celebrating the word of God. Uh, and the pilgrim statue made its way once again to Rome. I think it's one of the most <laughs> best travelled <laughs> pilgrim statues that we've ever had here. You never know what's going to happen next. <laughs> or what's going to come next. He always seems to manage to pull in these big occasions like the Pope arriving or going to Rome, going to New York. Um, I think he's, he's certainly a person with great vision 
um, and with great enthusiasm and ambition for Nock, I find. And I think that's, that's his great quality, his ambition for Nock Shrine. He has brought Nock into the 21st century without a shadow of a doubt. mentioned your hesitation and worry were you making the right mm. uh, choice and going on to be the priesthood mm. what would you say to a young man that was uh, that's today is in your position that you were back then I would say try it there's no harm in trying it, it used to be the case years and years ago that if you went in it was almost a disgrace or a, a shame if you came back out again but that's not the case at all you take it it's an option in your life if you think that it may be an option for you try it out try it for a year it just it doesn't matter if, if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out you go back to your and nobody will think any 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 differently of you it's an entirely different way so not to be afraid to try it just try it out uh, and at, at least you'll have engaged with it you'll know whether it's, it's for you or not and you can make a proper adult decision in terms of that well father richard thank you very much for taking this time out of your very busy schedule and uh, for giving us such great interviews not at thank all. you, thank very, you much. very much indeed thank you